Hello, Global Gardeners, and welcome to another edition of Your Gardening Week on a Monday. I'm happy to be here today. It's good to see you all here today, too. And a special shout out to Tony from Simplified Gardening YouTube channel is with us today. Let's actually begin by talking about Gazutska. PD is picking up some wood chips and soil and talked about harvesting Gazutska already. And this is one of those terms I bet you very few of you have even heard of. It's considered to be an Italian squash, but it's actually a gourd that is eaten like a squash. And it can grow quite long and twisty. And I've actually never had it, but it's one of those classic Italian squashes used in Italian cooking. So good for you, PD, to raise a, a new word for gardeners all around the globe, gazutska. And so if you're looking for something fun to grow, check it out. I do know that Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds has gazutska seed, if it's something you want to check out next year. And, and it raises an interesting point. I, I talk about this all the time, where you should, in my opinion, try something completely different every year, something that you've never done before, something you're totally unfamiliar with, and you might discover something that you like. So today's word of the day is Gazutska. There you have it. I think I might actually check it out and grow some next year. So thank you for bringing that up, PD. It's always nice to, to have the good stuff and the new stuff to start the show we're going to talk a lot about pests today and primarily i'm going to focus on animal pests we talk a lot about the insect pests in the garden uh, but we don't talk as much about the animal pests in our garden and this year or this week in particular i started having some noticeable damage to my fruit trees from a couple young deer who have discovered my next door neighbor's garden and my garden. So that's kind of what generated the topic of the day because I'm taking corrective action. And I thought, hey, I'm taking corrective action. Let's share some of these thoughts with the global gardeners because we can all learn from activities that we can share. So as we talk about the pests today, by all means, throw out your questions, throw out your answers to others' questions. And by the end of the day, hopefully we'll all be a little more knowledgeable when it comes to the pests that we have. So, so nice to see everybody here. Everybody's checking in. Mary J says, lots of cockroaches here in my garden this year. And I'm lucky in that respect. We do not have a big cockroach problem in Colorado. But this raises an interesting point as we start talking about pests, be they insect pests or animal pests. You need to learn about your pest and what causes that pest to find your garden. It's often because you have set up an environment or you have an environment nearby that is satisfactory for that particular pest. And so they find it and they move in and then they find your garden. And that's what happened with the deer. So in some of my videos, you'll be able to see my neighbor's yards and the background of uh, my own garden is my neighbor's yards. And I live in a very arid region, very few lawns. It's almost all rock. It's very dry. It's dusty. It's hot. And my neighbor has one of the few spots in our entire area with lots of trees and grass and shade. And so I suspect that the deer saw her yard as a little mini forest and they started jumping the fence and sleeping there at night because it's protected from possible predators because of all the trees and the shade makes it nice and cool in our, our hot summer late days and early mornings that they're still in the backyard at that point. And then as they venture out, they're discovering my garden, particularly the apple trees, as a nice little treat to start the morning. Well, cockroaches and everything else follow that same basic pattern. If they find a nice inviting place to move into, then they'll be happy and they'll tend to stay there. So as we talk more about 
pest, kind of keep that in the back of your mind that if you can disturb their comfort, you can often get rid of or, or dr dramatically decrease the problem you have with some of these pests. Okay, let's see what we have popping up. Torches and pit pitchforks, hello to you. Veggies are super slow, but cannabis is humming along. Good for you. This is one of those things for uh, if, if you are a cannabis grower, which is most often done indoors, a lot of the heat we've been having and a lot of the, the moist conditions we've been having throughout the world, but particularly the United States, can actually be quite suitable for cannabis. Years and years ago, I worked, believe it or not, with a lion trainer in Reno, Nevada, at, at one of the big hotels that had a lion as a mascot. And Reno, Nevada is very similar to where I'm at in Colorado right now. And in some years, I knew of some growers where the lion was living that had some really good success with cannabis outside. And that's a, a 5B, 6A zone. And so it's, it's amazing when you learn how to grow plants and where to grow them you can have some wonderful success. So that's that's pretty incredible. Okay, Yankee Sisters checking in. Always nice to have you here. A sunny six or 78 degrees in Connecticut. That's about 26 degrees Celsius. And I'm sure it's going to be warming up well beyond that. We've got some really beautiful weather here. Shandy's Garden, Hamilton, Ohio, 6B, started the jack-o'-lantern seeds. I have indeed actually uh, my jack-o'-lantern uh, pumpkin plants are doing quite well right now and just starting to get some flowers on my jack-o'-lanterns. So let's actually start there because that's another reason I wanted to talk about some of the insect or some of the animal pests in the garden because I'm growing pumpkins on my hugoculture mound. And so I created this long bed using hugoculture methods. And this last year covered those mounds pretty thickly with wood chip mulch. And so uh, Mage Gray Wolf had pointed out earlier that mulch can be a good way to deter some of these pests, like squirrels and cats, for instance. If you have a chunky, thick mulch like wood chips, you can actually keep squirrels and cats from digging in your beds. It can be quite effective because they have tender little uh, paws and don't want to be digging in the chunky bark or wood chips. But there are a lot of pests that will. And so I have one chicken of my neighbors that keeps hopping the fence and coming to my jack-o'-lantern pumpkin hugoculture bed and just tearing it apart because there are grubs that are in that wood chip mulch. And so now I've got to take some different actions to get the chicken from digging up my mulch to get at the grubs and uh lila or not lila um someone was asking about grubs earlier um and nematodes can be a great way to deal with grubs so as i look to next year i will probably get some nematodes to deal with my grub problem anticipating that the chicken will probably still hop the fence to get to my grubs and if there's no grubs it's not going to tear up my beds but in the meantime, there are a handful of things that I think we need to think about, particularly with animal pests. And the first being a barrier of some type. And barriers really are the most effective way to deal with some of these pests. So when it comes to a chicken pecking and digging and clawing out all of my mulch, I'm going to have to lay chicken wire poultry wire. I'll actually put it on top of the wood chip mulch so that the chicken can't get in there and dig at it. And so chicken wire is specifically designed to keep chickens out of many different areas. It's typically mounted like a fence to, as a barrier to keep chickens out, but you can also lay it on the ground to keep a lot of these pests away. And so Chicken wire, poultry wire, is also very effective against squirrels and 
against cats and against dogs and anything else that might be digging in your garden. Think about laying it out on top of your mulch. If you have smaller plants or seeds, they can actually grow up through the wire in most cases, or you can lay the wire around your plants. I did this as well against a rabbit issue that I had. And so I was growing, or still am actually, some young aronia plants, some choke cherries. And the rabbits kept eating these small plants to the point that they couldn't get established last year when I first put them in. So I took chicken wire and just built little domes to put over the small plants. And now this year, they're doing great. So chicken wire is one of my go-to fixes for many of the pests. Lay down horizontally, set up as a fence, bent into a dome. It's a really nice barrier to keep some of these animal pests at bay. And that's what you're really looking for, is a barrier to keep that pest away from your plant or away from digging in your bed. And when they dig in the bed, they'll end up destroying your plants because in many cases, they damage the roots and just totally disrupt everything. So there's the first little bit, and we'll talk about more. Let's see what else we have. Ultimate Gardening, nice to see you here again. In the last couple of weeks, we've, we've talked about Ultimate Gardening and the Ultimate Gardening channel, which um, is a new channel with a, a burgeoning young gardener. So I'll give another shout out for the Ultimate Gardening channel as well this year or this or this day for you to, to learn more stuff for this year. David, slugs are devouring my hot pepper plants. They're leaving other plants alone. Uh, and, oh, and so slugs are always a problem. Um, I, I tend to think one of the best ways to deal with slugs is traps. And so you can roll up wet newspaper, you can put down wet cardboard, you can put down wet carpets, um, fragments or, or strips, and that will tend to attract the slugs overnight into the early morning. And so first thing in the morning, you go out to your garden and you pick up the wet newspaper, the wet cardboard, the wet carpet, and then toss it. And that's a great way to... To, to deal with the slugs. And if you stay on top of it, that's, that's often enough. And then if you have a thick, chunky, dry mulch on top, that also deters them to some degree. They'll, they'll crawl across uh, wood chip mulch with no problem. But they per if, if they encounter an area like with uh, dry rocky mulch or dry chip mulch, and right next to it is an area without that kind of rough base, they're going to crawl across the grass and they're going to crawl into an easier area. And so there's a couple of different thoughts there for pests when we talk about insect pests, but primarily animal pests. And, and this is another approach I take is when you recognize that they are eating a particular type of plant, you accept that you will sacrifice some of your plants to those pests. And so I know it's no fun, but let's talk about peppers and slugs right now, for instance. In the future, you can anticipate that you'll have more slugs and those slugs will like your pepper plants. plants. So plant extra pepper plants, but in the area where you know you have a slug problem, just accept that you're gonna lose a lot of those plants and put the plants that you want in this case, let's say hot pepper plants, in a completely different bed, in a completely different area. And so there's something about that first spot that the slugs like. They found it, they're going to feed there. If you can keep their focus on that area, well, then you can grow in another area and probably have few, if any, slug problems. And so this is an approach my, my brother and sister-in-law take this approach with squirrels they set up squirrel feeders on their fence. And so in one corner of their yard, they have a squirrel feeder on, on one side, and then they have a squirrel feeder on the other side leading into that corner. And the squirrels in their area are running back and forth on both of those fences. So where do the squirrels go? The squirrels go to that corner for the peanuts that they put into the squirrel feeders. On the complete opposite side of their yard is where they're growing the plants that the squirrels might be interested in. 
And so by having that sacrificial area or that area that is prime with food for those animal pests, you keep them away from the other area. And so it, it's, it's like smoke and mirrors, if you will. It's bait and switch. It's giving them something that they really like and that's where they'll go and that's where they'll stay in most instances. And then you can try to deal with them in that area. So squirrels, at least in our area, if you trap or kill a squirrel, another three are going to move in. And so that's why they've taken the, the approach, that approach with squirrels, because they know they have two squirrels. In the past, when they tried to control the squirrels, they would have as many as four or five squirrels that were competing to take over that territory. And so sometimes the enemy you know is better than the enemy you don't know. And I do this with my rabbits. I let some areas of my garden just grow. A lot of the native plants, the native weeds, I let them grow. I don't mow it down because that's what the rabbits are eating. The native rabbits are eating the native plants. So I let that garden area grow for the rabbits. And they stay out of my vegetable garden because they're happy in that secluded, protected area where their natural uh, foods are growing. And so I, I think that can be a very effective way to deal with some of these animal pests is keep them happy someplace else. At my last house, the last garden I had, I had no squirrel issues in my yard because my neighbor fed the squirrels had bird feeders and squirrel feeders, and that's where the squirrels hung out. So I know it might be an idea you're not used to. We want, we think in terms of getting rid of these pests. It might be easier and more effective to learn to live with the pests, and then you won't have them destroying the garden areas that you're trying to protect in the first place. Okay, yeah, Mage Gray Wolf is saying I left one patch of sweet potatoes open to the rabbits. There you go. That's a, exactly the way I did. And, and you're right, Paul, they, the squirrels really do have turf wars. If you've never seen the squirrels fighting each other on the fence to take over an area, it's actually um, quite humorous. It's one of those things. Uh, and actually, yesterday we were watching hummingbirds. The hummingbirds are actually quite territorial. And so we were watching the hummingbirds um, battling for the, the rights to the feeder. And so that's always a lot of fun as well. Um, Big B, the fluffy redneck is redneck saying deer is my biggest problem or largest problem. Yeah, I'm finding that too. I failed to deter deer. You need a deck of tricks to use every week or so. Red, really tempted to try and get a pest license so I kill them so they can stop eating everything. And so depending on where you are now, where I'm at, um, it, it's actually against the law to, to kill the deer, even if they're in your own yard. Uh, and that is definitely an option, but it's kind of the same issue with the squirrel. I saw this again in my last neighborhood. When we would get rid of one herd of deer, another would move right in. And it was a, an area with a lot of trees. And when I first moved into that house, um, we had 12 to 14 deer that would bed in our backyard under our trees. And as I started taking actions, that, that was greatly reduced. But there would be roaming bands of young deer of four to six and even bigger when you have the, the lead buck with his harem roaming through the neighborhood. And so that's why I say sometimes uh, learning to live with the pest can be better because you never know how many more will move in. But you're exactly right. Often with deer, it is a whole bunch of tricks. And you've probably seen that you can make a garlic spray and you put the garlic spray on your plants and that deters deer. Sure, it does for about a day. And that you can um, plant very specific plants, the fragrant plants uh, like lavender and mint to deter deer. Yes, that works for a couple days. And you can um, put up, you know, a hot chili spray, and that will work for a couple days. The, the thing about it is the deer learn the tricks. And so they might be deterred in the beginning, but then they just come back and they realize, oh, those plants are sprayed with red pepper, but these others aren't. 
And so unless you're treating your entire garden space on a regular basis, it's not going to have much effect. Now, there are some things that you can use. Um, they, they make those things, I think they're I think they're called a scarecrow or a crow something where you hook it up to your water hose it's a motion activated sprinkler and so when the deer come through the sprinkler pops up and sprays them and that works for a few days before they get used to it you can put up scarecrows scarecrows actually work pretty well for a couple days these are smart animals and they're going to learn the tricks and so you have to keep rotating it you have to keep trying new things or like uh, I am, am trying now or doing is the barriers. The barriers tend to be the most effective control against animal pests. And so this last year I got, or this last week, I got a long roll of bird netting, which is my other secret trick. So one is the chicken wire. The other is the bird netting, which is a a woven net that you can put over hoops or over plants. And so yesterday I went and got some 10 foot long metal conduits and I'm going to bury those right next to all my fruit trees and then use those as a mount to hang bird netting over my fruit trees. And so here's, here's why I wanted to bring this up today because we often think of a lot of these things we use in our garden as a single purpose product. So when you buy bird netting, it's often what we think of as the thing to control birds. Therefore, we use it to control birds and we don't think about it controlling other things. Well, if you hang bird netting over a young fruit tree, the deer can't get to the branches to start chomping on them. And that's the approach I'm taking. I'm using a barrier to keep the deer away from my apple trees. And that barrier is a plastic bird netting that's just draped over the trees. And I've done that as well to keep the rabbits out of my beds. I put the hoops in the beds and I put the bird netting over the hoops to keep the rabbits out. So start expanding your world a little bit and realizing you can use a lot of these products in different ways. I talked about the chicken wire laid on the mulch or as a fence. Underneath all of my beds, I have either the chicken wire or hardware cloth because I have burrowing animal pests as well. So I have no problems with gophers burrowing under my beds because all of my beds have a wire barrier to keep the gophers out. So as you build your garden and expand it, you have to anticipate that you might have some of those pests and build your bed accordingly and build your garden accordingly as well. Now it was, um, someone was, actually I know I wrote it down, um, Lila, Lila Lindholm has voles and I have a vole issue as well. In fact, I just saw the other day underneath my thick wood chip mulch i saw a vole jump into a hole so i've got voles that are burrowing under my mulch that's one reason why i have the high raised beds is because of a vole problem and this gets back to the barrier idea if a, a vole is scurrying underneath the mulch and they encounter a two foot high raised bed they're going to keep on going until they get to those native plants or those other plants that are in the ground that they can feed upon. And so in this case, a raised bed becomes a barrier for a small pest like a vole. And do learn these different pests and what they look like. A few years back at the last house, my wife told me that she had rescued a mouse that had fallen down into the window well. And so she had gone from outside, reached into the window well, rescued this mouse and set it free. And then as I asked more about it, it wasn't a common field mouse, it was a vole. And she released the vole right into one of the garden bed areas. And so we had to do some education on the difference between a field mouse and a vole. But a lot of the controls for a lot of these different pests do rely on you knowing exactly what the pest is and what you can do to control it. 
One of the things I do to control my voles, I've mentioned this in recent weeks, is to encourage the, the cats that are roaming the neighborhood. And so I was actually surprised to see that bull because I know that the cat I mentioned a couple weeks ago that tends to roam through my yard in early morning, that cat has taken care of some gophers and I know that cat has taken care of some voles. And so I, I let the cat roam free through my garden because it's on a hunt for those pests in my garden. If you have a cat, you might, if it's an outdoor cat, you might consider letting the cat out a little early in the day to go hunting for voles and, or, or the field mice if you're concerned about the, the mice that you have in your area. Cats can be quite effective. My dog, Lily, was very effective at keeping the squirrels away from the garden. The squirrels would be roaming through the, the bird feeders of the next door neighbors, but when they ventured closer to the backyard that was Lily's yard, Lily would always chase the squirrels away. And I've had many dogs in the past that chased the squirrels. So Lily doesn't do that anymore. She usually takes a step towards a squirrel and stops because she just doesn't run like she used to. But think about that as well. Some of your household pets can be a deterrence for some of these pests that might be finding their way into your garden. So like we were just talking about, it's using a mix, a variety of all of these deterrents to really get the best effect. There's, there's rarely one single thing that will work against a particular pest. You need to mix things up a little bit. So let's see what else we have. Highlands Community Club saying, I'm thinking of getting a feral cat through my county's program for rats. Yeah, there you go. And uh, they, the house we lived at, my very first videos of about 10, 11 years ago were filmed at that house we had. And we had a barn a little lower down on the on the property and yeah there were cats feral cats that lived in the barn never fed them never took care of them they took care of themselves because they would feed from the horse troughs and then they would feed upon the mice and the voles and gophers and everything else that were living there so feral cats really can be quite effective at dealing with some of those things Rachel's saying, I noticed a hole dug in the middle of my strawberry bed. I'm considering moving the berries into towers. Is that possible with established plants? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I'm, I'm planning on doing that this week. If you saw my recent video with the green stock leaf system, the vertical garden, uh, I'm putting strawberries in there, and that's what I'm doing. I'm digging up some of the plants and moving them into the vertical tower to, to grow as well. Uh, you're, when you do that, you will probably notice, unless it's a very young plant, you won't get fruit this year. So once you disrupt the, the main strawberry plant and then replant it, you've stressed the plant enough that it might send up some flowers. You might get some fruit, but probably not. So use this year as the point to move them. And then next year, you'll probably see an improved harvest. But yeah, absolutely. You can you can move strawberry plants pretty effectively. It's it's not a problem at all. Lola Young Gardens of Love. Hello to you watching over here. Mega love shout out host. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Mega shout out as well. So I appreciate that. That's always nice to have people checking in. Okay. Oh, okay. So here we go. Cheryl saying I already did that this weekend. I got the vertical. Awesome. Um, yeah, the vertical growing. One of the things, so I've been asked a lot of questions about the green stock system. I love the green stock. You can see a link in the description of my videos to, to get a green stock if you're interested in it. Um, but the question I've been asked a lot since I did that video is about strawberries. And uh, yes, you can grow strawberries in the green stock system. What I don't know for sure is the overwintering of the strawberries like in a zone five like i'm in in that vertical growing system there are extra steps you need to take and so in the ground the the plants usually do pretty well in an area like mine where we get lots of snow because the snow helps keep the soil moist before during and after the soil freezes but the problem with growing in containers, like a vertical garden, 
is that the soil tends to start drying out in winter and then it doesn't have any of the moisture replenished. And so by the time the spring comes, the soil is bone dry. Any roots in there are desiccated and killed. And so the plants don't come back. And so I'm planning on showing this, planning on tracking, and planning on making a video, which doesn't surprise you, to show how to overwinter plants in a vertical garden like the green stock. And it will involve watering on days in the middle of winter when it warms up enough to cause the soil to start to thaw out. And so typically that's above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is about four and a half degrees Celsius. When the weather warms up above that point in winter, you should consider watering your plants in containers so that they don't die from desiccation when the springtime comes. So you'll see more about that, but uh, that's one of my projects this week is to move strawberry plants from the ground into the green stock and to start growing them. So uh, a lot of fun there. And Jay Dixon is always on top of things. I appreciate that. We'll give a shout out to Lola Young Gardens of Love channel. And there's a link. I'll, I'll be sure and check that out when we're done here as well. Always, always looking for great ways to to share the wealth. And so let me give a shout out. I'm not sure if Tony is still on, but Tony had a great video last week where he highlighted 15 of the channels that he watches on YouTube. And uh, I was on there, as were many of the ones that you probably watch as well. But he also had a number of YouTube channels that were quite small low subscriber base, just starting out. And so I would always like to give a shout out when I can. And I appreciate it when the, the uh, YouTube creators like Tony give a shout out. And I know Scott Head, who's been uh, on this, this live stream as well, and I'm a big fan of Scott Head, does the same thing. He'll highlight some of the channels he's watching. So um, it's always nice to, to get all of us watching all the different people we can. But uh, yeah, check out um, Tony's on the Simplify Gardening channel. Check out his video and uh, you'll see the 15 that, that he's most interested in. And so I'm anticipating um, that I'll do one like that. Um, I don't, you know, it's funny. I, I, I set out my plan for my videos and my plan goes a couple months out and I'll modify the plan, but that's often why I can do a video like the, the one I did uh, over the weekend on how to make garlic powder. I've been planning that video for months. I just had to wait until I harvested my garlic and then let it season a little bit and then go through the two day process of making the garlic powder and filming and editing and all the rest of it. So I've been planning that video um, for a long time and then I'm, I'm now getting it out there at the appropriate time because most of us are either harvesting or have recently harvested. That's how I plan my videos. I'm also planning videos like, here's my favorite channels. Well, when Tony beats me to the punch and does his top 15 video channels on YouTube, I now have to slide mine back because I don't want it to look like I'm copying Tony's channel, even if it's an idea I already have. And so, um, I, I just think it's funny. I think there's a lot of the others of us that do the same thing. We'll have videos that all come out the same week and it looks like we're copying each other, but really it's an idea all of us have had previously. So look later in the year, I'll do my favorite YouTube channel video um, just to, to give you some variety from Tony's video here in the summer and I'll be doing one in the winter. Um, so yeah, and, and there's thanks Jay. Jay is, is giving a link um, to Tony's Simplified Gardening. And uh, and make sure you, uh, you know, give a shout out. You, when you go to another channel, I think it's awesome um, to give a shout out. The I talked uh, recently about Alberta Urban Gardens channel. Gave a shout out to there and suggested let him know that Gardener Scott sent you. And he was very gracious to send me a note thanking me for directing people to his site. So the same way, you know, it's nice to, to let people know 
what that string is, you know, not not for me to get credit. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's more so that that as those of us that are making videos see people who discover our channel for the first time, if you let us know where you discovered us from, then it's really appreciated. And so, so when Tony did that video um, that we've got the link here for, the uh, the number of people that came to my channel and said, hey, I discovered this channel from Tony O'Neill on Simplified Gardening. And it was greatly appreciated that uh, I knew that Tony had sent some of the, 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 the traffic in my direction. So that's always nice. So Greg Hill's asking, how did your purple snap peas do this year? Uh, and so the, um, the, the purple snap peas, I actually uh, haven't started yet. I got late in, in the season to start my pea. So I actually am starting the sugar snap peas here in the next week or two. But the purple beans that I'm growing are actually doing quite well. They've got flowers on them, and they're just starting to set the, the bean pods. So thank you for asking about that. My purple garden is actually doing quite well. So the purple carrots are, I think, the greens are probably about six to eight inches tall right now. They're doing great. The purple beans are about 18 inches high right now and starting to set flowers and they're they're continuing to grow the purple kohlrabi the plants look great but kohlrabi is one of those plants that if you plant a little bit late if it's too warm as they start to grow you might not get the big bulbing kohlrabi um, part that you want to harvest um, the plants are doing great i'm not sure how big of a harvest i'll be getting from them the purple okra is okay but those plants are only about six or eight inches tall and i've said this before just how hard it is for me to grow okra so the plants are doing great i don't know if i'm going to get any of that okra and then the purple potatoes are doing fabulously and so i'll probably be harvesting those here um in, in the not too distant future and then uh in the bed right next to it uh that i pointed out with the the fall garden seed selection that I did a video a week or so ago, that's where I'll be putting the purple peas going into the colder months. So thanks for asking. Thanks for remembering because it is one of those things that um, I think it's nice to, to, um, to, to try those new things. And especially uh, when my granddaughter is the one that gave me those purple peas to grow, uh, I've been... I, that's another reason I was delayed in the spring is because I wanted her to help me plant those and they're actually coming for a visit here on Wednesday and that's why I'm planning on putting the purple peas in this week so we'll see how that goes and there's Jay Dixon on top of things there's the Alberta Urban Gardens link as well and let him know that that I sent sent you over because he has uh, just started making some videos again. His older videos uh, are really good. Some really good in-depth scientific kind of gardening information. So I always like to, to see success. And he had stopped making videos for a while and now he's back at it. So Yankee Sista is saying, any ideas for keeping cucumbers while waiting to get enough for pickling? Yeah, cucumbers are one of those things. So cucumbers are, are best stored at room temperature if you're waiting to pickle them. And they'll keep for a few days without too much trouble. If you've started slicing them or you cut them into pieces, anticipating that you're going to pickle but you don't have enough, then you should store them in the refrigerator. But they'll keep for a few days. Um, I have noticed, depending on the type of cucumber, that the the firmness of the cucumber does start to degrade over time so i'll pick cucumbers and i'll typically do the same thing that you're asking i'll have them sit on the counter for three or four days waiting to get enough to pickle beyond that point i would rather do a, a harvest of cucumbers every day over the period of three or four days especially if you're growing the, the pickling cucumbers that you want to keep at like gherkin size, or if you want to keep it a small size, you have to harvest every day to keep them from getting past that size. And then regardless of how many I have, at three or four days, then I'll do some pickling, just so I don't have a problem with the, 
the firmness of the cucumber degrading by setting out for more than four days. What that may mean is you've got you may have to do a lot of small batch pickling so that you're dealing with the freshest fruit possible. I, one year I did try I think it was about seven to ten days. I wanted to do a big batch of pickling cucumbers. And so I, I picked some, and over the course of a week or so, I had them. And I could tell the difference. I could tell the difference in the pickles between the ones that were older and the ones that were that were younger and fresher. And it it's 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 obvious uh, to me at least when you're doing a big pickling like that, that when you eat the jar of pickles, you'll have one that's nice and crunchy, and then the next one is soft. And it's like, how could these be different in the same jar? We've got a soft pickle and a crunchy pickle. It's often because of the freshness of the cucumber itself. So uh, consider some, some small batches, and uh, that may help you out a little bit. But yeah, just room temperature on the counter out of the sun is the way that I'll store my cucumbers before I start using them. And then after that point, I'll put them into the refrigerator because they've typically gone past that point of good pickling. And then I'll slice them up for salads or whatever else it happens to be. So, okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Always good. Melissa Sullivan and the responses to Melissa Sullivan are always nice. Um, let's see. Oh, I saw one right there. Yeah, Torches and Pitchforks is saying picklers become fresh eaters after about four days. There you go. That's what I was just talking about. And 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 there's it's okay. You can eat pickling cucumbers as a solid cucumber. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a question of um, the freshness and the texture of the pickle that you're after. And good tip. Let's go ahead and throw this out there because this is a, a important piece of information. And so when you're making your pickles, there are a few things you can do. You could add alum to your uh, your pickles if you want you you can uh, do something like a bay leaf in the in um that might have been my pickled beet video i forget which which fermented product i was making in a video i used grape leaves grape leaves can be very effective what you're looking for is something that uh, has tannin so if you're going to use a leaf of some type like a bay leaf or a pickle leaf the tannins in those leaves uh, will actually help crisp up the cucumbers you can use oak leaves I know people that use oak leaves when they make pickles for the same reason it's the tannins that are in those leaves that help keep the cucumber crisp longer when you're doing the pickling process so uh, if you see something weird like uh, a recipe that tells you to throw in a bay leaf or an oak leaf or a grape leaf that's why now the the bay leaf will affect the flavor a little bit more than some of the others but it's definitely something that that you can consider patricia is saying i pulled up calabrese broccoli what can i plant there so check out my video that i just did a week ago where i went through the entire list of things that you can put into your beds right now after you've pulled something like broccoli or any of the other plants that you're doing. So a long list of things, and I go through them all in that recent video that I just did. The, the video is what you can still plant in July. So go to the Gardner Scott homepage on YouTube, and it'll be one of the most recent uploads, and you can just click on it from there, and that'll tell you everything that you can consider doing at this time of year to um, get some plants in the ground. Um, Craig is saying, can you can snap peas? Absolutely. In fact, I have a video on fermenting um, snap peas. That's one thing I do is to turn them into um, a pickle, basically, of snap peas. That's one way to do it. But you can definitely can them. Now, the reason I ferment them and pickle them is because when you can them, they are a low acid uh, harvest and so when you can low acid crops you need to use pressure canning methods so you can can peas but you'll need to use a pressure canner to do it 
it's so much easier in my mind. You blanch the peas first in boiling water for 30 to 45 seconds or so, then pop them into uh, the ice bath and then freeze them on a tray. That's a very effective way to, to preserve uh, snap peas. Or you can turn them into a pickle, which is another great way to eat snap peas, either using a vinegar method or a fermentation method. Uh, so lots of different ways that you can you can use the peas. So yeah, look into if you want to can them. You'll need a pressure canner. Uh, I think that's one of the, one of the problems I have with pressure canning some of those harvests like peas is it tends to make for a mushy product. Whereas if you freeze them. Uh, it'll be nice and fresh and you can use them in a number of different ways without about too many issues. Uh, I think I mentioned a week or two ago when we were talking about preserving that I can't pressure can in where I'm at because I'm at 7,500 foot elevation and the pressure canners that are affordable are not calibrated at that high altitude and so I can't pressure can just because I'm a too high altitude but for lower altitudes that definitely uh, is a consideration and is something that you can you can look into uh, yeah there you go Rachel says green beans and snap peas have to be pressure canned for so long that they're gross and that's what I mean when I say they turn mushy it's just uh, unless you're making them for like a pea soup where they're going to be cooked and mushiness doesn't matter I think freezing is a much better uh, approach to, to doing something like that. Um, okay, let's see. I, I, since we're, I want to talk about all of the stuff today with the animal pest, let me make sure I, I'm talking about some of the other things that uh, I, I want to I, I want all of us to consider when we talk about the pest. So talked about the barriers, talked about giving them something else to eat, talked about doing some of the predators that you can encourage into your area talked about uh, just living with them uh, and then you know the the other consideration is plant selection if you have a steady pest that you just can't get rid of now you can start thinking about the the plants you're growing and so back to the deer which is in my garden what generated the discussion for this week as I looked at my fruit trees, I noticed that my plum tree wasn't eaten at all. And my pear tree had just a nibble on it. And the peach tree was left completely alone. But the apple trees were eaten pretty, pretty good. It, it, I think just about every tip of every branch of every apple tree was eaten by the deer. And the tree's still alive and the inner leaves are still doing pretty well, but these are young trees, which is why I've gone to the trouble to put the bird netting this week over those trees so that they'll recover and the leaves that are there will continue to grow and support the tree into the winter. Uh, but the idea is when you learn those type of things, if I wasn't able to keep my deer under control, and I had so many deer and so many trees that I was going to grow that I couldn't put barriers, couldn't put bird netting over every single tree. Well, the solution might be to not grow apple trees and instead grow plum and peach and pear trees. And this holds true with all the other pests in your garden. If you notice that you have a pest that's focused in on a particular plant and leaving all the other plants alone, well, then start growing more of those other plants because the pests aren't going to eat them. And I know it's hard because as gardeners, we have things that we want to grow. But at times, you may need to modify your preferences because of the pests you have in your garden. And it, it runs counter to everything we want to do as a gardener. But sometimes those are the things that you need to consider. Uh, the, the, the other thing you can do that kind of ties in with this, and I call this camouflage gardening, is to grow those plants that you know the pest is not going to eat, or at least less likely to eat, and use that as essentially a barrier. 
And so I did this at my last house at well as well with some of the flowers that I wanted to grow that I knew deer tended to eat. I surrounded the bed with plants like uh, the the uh, yarrow. Yarrow is a plant that deer typically don't eat. Lavender. Lavender are plants that deer typically don't eat. And so in a couple of my beds, all the way around the edge of the bed, I was growing yarrow and lavender. And then inside the bed, I was growing some of those spring flowering bulbs that deer tend to eat. And they didn't devour those plants in that bed like they would someplace else. So when you learn about the plants that your pest doesn't like to eat, you can use that to your advantage, either by focusing on growing that plant as a primary harvest, or now focusing on growing that type of plant as a deterrence for the pest moving into that bed to eat those other type of plants that you're trying to save. So I found that to be a pretty effective way to, to grow some of what I want to grow that the, the animals might otherwise eat. So Yankee Sister, thanks so much. Love starting my week off watching Gardener Scott and being with all the great gardeners. And I, I put you in that list. You're one of the great gardeners that I like to spend my Monday with as well. So thank you so much for that contribution, super chat, and always nice to hear. I know it wasn't that long ago you weren't able to be here every week, and it's nice to see you every time that you can. That's that's an incredible. All of you are incredible. I say it every week. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Carla is saying one of life's lessons learned in the garden, acceptance is the key. I, and I love that. Exactly. That's that's how I like to garden. You know, I talk about it in terms of trying to create a, a natural environment where everything works together. You'll have your pests and you'll have your predators and you have uh, an environment that has, is as close to nature as we can create. And so I allow it to create itself as much as possible. But you're right. A lot of that is acceptance. A lot of it is just accepting that you're going to have pests. And look at what's happened so much with commercial agriculture. In the effort to, to, to get rid of some of the pests that, that attack the big fields, they've reverted to to doing things with chemicals that just isn't healthy and then creating specific strains and of plants that that no one else has access to and then creating these big conglomerates of corporate agriculture it's so much nicer in the home garden to just accept that you're going to have some of these problems and some of these pests and stay away with from some of those big ag solutions, which I think in the end really don't create uh, a lot of the solution and instead create new problems that you can't even anticipate. So there you have it. Uh, let's go ahead and look behind me because I don't want to forget uh, like I did recently. And the garden that you see behind me is coming from Terry and Alan Trafton. And I think it's a beautiful garden space. They had actually sent me a picture months ago of their garden that I was going to show. And so I'll, I'll mention this before I talk about um, the pictures that Terry sent me again. Uh, I welcome you, your garden pictures to put as a backdrop on this Monday show. And I love talking about and highlighting the things I think that are awesome for all of us to learn from your gardens. But the photo really does need to be a full photo size photo. And so when Terry had sent me the photos a few months ago, they were basically just thumbnail pics. And when I enlarged it to put it in the background, it was too grainy and it just didn't show good. So I had to ask them to resend the pictures full size and then I can use them. So when you send a photo, please give me the full file and it will show up better in these live streams. Otherwise, I might not be able to use it. And then, of course, give me your permission to use the photos and, and then any background that you would like to share if, if you want me to say something in particular for your photo. And so let me turn to, to Terry and Alan's garden. I think, obviously, this is a beautiful garden. You've probably already been looking at it. 
but there are a couple design elements that I wanted to point out. So right here is this tree. And I like to do that as well. I like to have a, a, a main structure in the garden that brings your eye to the center of your garden. Now, in my, my garden that I'm building and designing right now, I started with nothing. So I had no trees. I had no natural components to act as that anchor point. And so I think it's great if you have a tree like this, that, and obviously they've pruned it all the way up, uh, that anchors your eye to the center of the garden. And then it draws your eye to all the other things, the flowers, the plants, and it really creates an enjoyable visual aspect to the garden. Now in my garden, because I don't have a big tree, that's why I've put in the big archway that I've got the, the, the big anchored planters. That's a visual component to bring the eye into the center of the garden. And then I'll build a pergola that is in the exact center of my garden with that same thought in mind. And so if you don't have a tree, you can build a structure to achieve the same thing. But I think they did a great job using a, a tree and then clearing out the space underneath the tree to put in their their garden setting and then directly behind me you can see their little greenhouse their hoop house is simply uh, PVC hoops covered with plastic now on this side they've got the fiberglass corrugated panels where the doorway is but learn something from that that's a great design where the sides are a rigid structure so you can put a door in it so in this case it's wood and corrugated fiberglass but the actual covering the actual greenhouse material can be simply pvc's pvc tubing and plastic thrown over it and so uh, I, I i really like their garden space and what they've done with it and if you look back here this is also something i really like I'll be putting more of those in my garden, but this looks to be one of those spinner art pieces. And so I like having artwork in the garden and those spinners, you've seen the peacock that is in the background of some of my videos. I like having that kind of stuff. And so when I see it in other gardens, I instantly like those gardens as well because they're breaking it up. They've got, they've got pots around the edges. They've got bushes in the background. They've got plants that are growing in and out of the greenhouse, and it, it's so nice to see what other gardeners are doing. So thank you to Terry and Alan for allowing me to, to share your photo and also for bearing with me as we had to communicate back and forth for the resend of the photo of their garden space. So I think it's, it's really good. Jennifer is saying, I did something very similar. I used pallets as low walls, then the PVC piping. There you have it. Another great idea. See how we can build on each other with our ideas is to to share that. So thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. I think that's a great idea. The low walls of pallets and then the same idea that Terry and Alan did. You don't have to do it just one way. You can do it how it best fits your garden space and what products you have. You don't need, need to go out and buy something if you already have something like pallets that you can use. So, okay, let's see. M.E. Miller is saying, birds won't perch on my tomatoes. They don't like to try chrome hairs on the stems. I zip-tied some small branches to my tomato stakes so the Orioles land on the branches and pick off the worms. That's a good tip. Um, and, and I like that idea. I, I have my trellises. I'll, I'll put the tomato uh, plants up the trellises, either a cattle panel trellis or I actually have... Uh, a welded wire fencing that I'm using as trellises in my new enclosed garden space. And so that, that's a good point because I don't think often about that. I'll watch the birds land on the wire trellising that I'm using and that gives them access to the worms, the tomato hornworms and the other caterpillars that are on the tomatoes. But that's a good idea. I like that idea where you can actually put some smooth wooden branches and you can tie them to your trellis or however you you attach them around your tomatoes but that brings the birds in to eat the caterpillars great idea thanks for sharing that uh I, 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 that's that's one of those things i think that 
um, is something I hadn't really thought about before. I use branches in a number of different ways, uh, but that's one way to do it. And so Jay's asking, I have large amount of curved tree branches. Can they be used for a greenhouse? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the I'm actually saving some of my longer branches. I'll be doing um, a video. I wanted to do it this year. I'm not sure if I'll get to it this year. I may move it back to next year. But where I, I will be using tree branches to build structures in my garden, primarily as trellises. But yes, by all means, if you've got long enough curved branches, uh, use them kind of like what we, you see behind me. Instead of PVC pipe, no reason why you can't use a tree branch to accomplish the same thing. You'll need to have some additional supports probably along the side and the top, um, but go for it. I think that's a, that's a, a fun project, Jay, and you can tell us how it turns out. I think Go for it. Start off small so that you can understand the engineering and see if it's something you like, but then expand it. Sure. Okay, let's see. Um, Nick from Yuma is saying, I've been having the opposite problem. Too many birds. Has anyone ever used an ultrasonic bird repellent before? Good question. I have not used an ultrasonic bird repellent. I have used the ultrasonic gopher repellent, which it looks like a um, a big torpedo that you bury in the ground to keep gophers away. And it, again, it's one of those things that initially it works and then they get used to it. And so if you've used one of those ultrasonic um, sound um, devices that is supposed to keep birds away, share with Nick and the rest of us because I'm guessing it might have worked well in the beginning, but then the birds probably got used to it and it doesn't work as effectively anymore. Always, always one of those things to throw into your bag of tricks and and have it on for a while and then have some of those other deterrents and then turn it off and then turn it back on again and and cycle through at random times and that may work. Idaho huge Hoosier, thanks for that super chat contribution. Appreciate that. Blessings from hot smoky Idaho. Thanks for sharing for y'all's continued knowledge. Um, yeah, it's we the California fires have been so intense that here in Colorado we've been getting smoke from those fires. And I actually saw a news report that said New York was getting some of the smoke from those fires. As the wind patterns have changed and those fires are are burning in different areas, yeah, we're now getting some of the smoke from the Idaho fire. So it this is such a crazy time of year. Every year recently where we've had just such intense wildfires and the smoke is affecting a lot of us. So um, sorry to hear that you're having to, to deal with that hot smokiness, but um, let's hope it ends pretty soon. I was just, uh, we, we were actually looking at uh, a map last night of Idaho. We had gone up to Glacier National Park a few years back and driven through Idaho and spent a few days there. And we were trying to recreate our route along some of the wilderness areas of Idaho. And Idaho is one of those states with incredible wilderness areas. And some of that is what's burning now. But uh, love Idaho, love that you're here. Thank, love that you are participating and gave that super chat. Thanks so much. Always nice to, to have everybody participating. Jennifer saying is very smoky here last week from the fires live in Long Island. Okay. And the moon was amazing. Yeah, when you get the smoke in the air, it, it really does make for for beautiful orange and red moons. Um, so I, that is one of those things I suppose you can enjoy from it. Uh, Idaho, Huger is saying Oregon's fire is the worst for us. And uh, we have family in Oregon. And so that is something we keep our eye on is the Oregon fires. Uh, my first wife... Uh, last year, they actually lost their house. I, I don't remember. I think I may have mentioned that uh, a year ago when we were talking about wildfires. And the area that my in-laws lived in was was decimated, was burned to the ground. So um, it's it's terrible. You have to deal with that. But hang in there. And gardening is one of those things to help you recover as quickly as possible, hopefully. Frank is saying, at the end of the season, do you cut your large sunflowers off or pull them? I cut a couple off last year, and now it's like having small tree stumps. Soon there won't be anywhere to plant. And so I do both, Frank. It depends. So the 
the the big tall sunflowers the ones that you know and, and probably like you i had sunflowers that were three inches or so in diameter and i took my saw and cut those down because it was a woody stump like exactly like you're saying now i did try to cut down as close to ground level as possible but when you pull out the sunflowers depending on where you're growing them you'll disrupt a large area and so i've got sunflowers growing in my front yard next to and near a lot of my perennial flowers and perennial bushes and so i'll cut down those sunflowers because i don't want to pull them and then have them disrupt the roots of the other nearby plants but for the smaller sunflowers uh, i'll definitely pull those out of the ground and and back to the idea of using the curved tree branches to make a, a, a an arch uh, greenhouse or hoop house like we've been talking about i save those sunflower stalks to use as teepee trellises and that's one of the things i want to show in this video i was just talking about where if you're growing a sunflower that's going to be six or eight or ten feet high and it's got a three inch diameter stalk that's a pretty sturdy stock and you can save that tie three or four of them together at the top and use that as a trellis for your beans or your peas or your tomatoes or your squashes or anything else that you want to grow vertically so uh, that's one reason why i cut them so that i can immediately put them in my old sunflower stem stack to use as a future trellis the younger ones I'll pull and I typically cut those up and put into my compost pile. Um, while they're still green, ideally, uh, that, but the heads, I almost always leave the heads in place. And so some of my sunflowers I allow to stay in place erect over the winter with the, the flower head in place so that the birds can feed on them during the winter. But I'll also, at the end of the season, cut down those big sunflowers because i don't think i don't think a big eight foot tall sunflower looks as nice by itself over the winter so i'll cut that stump off cut the head off and then lay that flower head right where the plant was for the birds to feed on in the winter as well so a couple of different ways you can do it you know whichever way you prefer based on the size of the sunflower uh, but that's why I pull some of them so that I do have space to plant the next year because I, I ran into that problem this year. Some of those stumps from last year, I, I'm not growing anything there this year because that stump and the sunflower root can occupy a lot of space. So uh, it depends on, on where it is, Frank, and, and what you want to do with that space. Uh, so do both. I would say pull some and cut some depending on where it's at so lila says i love the natural look in my garden awesome for you i love the natural look as well that's one of those things that uh it's i prefer a natural looking garden but i know uh, we all have our own uniqueness so do it the way you like to do it and if you like the natural go for it matt and sarah the kids and i made a trellis for them to play in with sunflower stems and we hope to grow on it unfortunately it didn't hold up we will certainly try it again though um, that's a that's a good idea as well and and the the thicker stems will do well I've, I've got sunflower stems that have lasted three years but that's the ones the big sturdy stocky ones that uh, are very woody at the end of the season so yes I suggest you try it again and have some fun with it I like the idea of the kids playing around the, the sunflowers um, Kevin is saying I got some 15 foot tall sunflowers and have a head to roast later today. Good for you. I'm growing a variety called Pikes Peak. Pikes Peak is actually the mountain here behind us in Colorado Springs. And those will grow 10 feet tall. And so um, those are my tall ones, but 15 feet, that's awesome. Jay is saying, advice wanted. How could I best protect the greenhouse cover if I use rough cedar branches as the main structure? And so one thing that I've seen, uh, and, and this is actually a good time of year to do it, that I've seen some people use when they're building a hoop house from a material like rough wood, 
is the, the, the pool floats, you know, those big long tubes that you, you get to float on in a swimming pool. You can do a slit uh, vertically through the whole tube and then just slide it over your tree branch. And that helps protect. Uh, also, I, I, I've seen that if you're using PVC even with a lot of joints and you have some type of horizontal support in the PVC, same thing. Put, the, put that foam pool float over the outside of a branch or PVC and that will help protect the plastic. So that's what I've seen. If you've got another suggestion, throw it out to Jay and we'll see what else we have. Uh, yeah, Melissa says noodles. That's exactly what they are. So um, let's see. Nick from Yuma saying, I'm about to grate original scent Irish Spring soap to get rid of rabbits. Thoughts? I actually have used um, Irish Spring soap as one of those things to deal with the deer and it and it can be quite effective now i actually read uh, after i was doing this and did some research i saw a university study believe it or not that was done on that that type of soap iris spring soap that is very very strong and it is effective at deterring deer i know that as part of the study but when you hang it from a plant or a fence and it's exposed to rain or you're watering and it begins to drip down onto the soil, a study I read said that it actually attracts voles. And so we talked earlier about trying to get rid of the voles. So the Irish Spring soap may deter things like deer, but it might attract other things like voles. I don't know about its effectiveness with rabbits, but... Uh, it's certainly one of those things that you can try. It's it's inexpensive. Buy some outrageously fragrant soap, put it around the area you're trying to protect, and then observe and see what the results are. And by all means, share with us later what your observations are. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Kevin saying, um, the big sunflowers I'm growing are Mongolian giant from Baker Creek. Okay, I've seen those in their catalog. And uh, ex yeah, actually on the cover. So good for you. I'm glad to hear that it actually works. We've talked about that before, how Baker Creek has such unique, interesting seeds. Their website is rareseeds.com, uh, but it doesn't always work out as well as possible. And so like I mentioned that I got the pink dandelion seed from Baker Creek and I put that in one of my beds. I haven't seen any pink dandelion plants yet. So I uh, can't can't always say that their seeds are give, going to give you the best germination, but they do have some wonderful seeds. So I'm glad you had good success with that. And Kiri is checking in. Don't worry about it at the last minute. Kiri is, uh, I think Kiri may be the only person um, that, that has seen all of these live streams start to finish because she helps me and goes through and keeps track of of the comments and everything else. She's the one that figures out all the timestamps. And, and so when she shows up live, she will also go back and watch the live stream in replay as well. So uh, there may be a few more of you out. And uh, so if, if you've actually gone from number one all the way to where we're at right now with this one, um, let me know, but I know Kiri has watched every single live stream on replay. So shout out to Kiri for doing that. And Tony's back. I don't know if you were listening, Tony, when we were talking about your uh, video that you recently did with your 15 YouTube channels that you watch, but I, I gave everybody a shout out to that and Jay gave a link to that video. So hopefully you'll have some new people checking that out. We were talking about what a great idea that is to, to send people to some of the smaller channels that we're unfamiliar with, but you obviously have discovered. So glad to see you back commenting, Tony. Always nice to have everybody here commenting. Um, and so, yeah, Kay Russell's asking if anyone's tried Irish Spring for rabbits or squirrels. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that I had the Irish Spring to deter the deer and I saw squirrels run right by it. 
So in an area they would normally run right by. So I have not seen any indication of it deterring squirrels, um, specifically in the gardens I've had, but you never know. Uh, oh, okay, glad to hear that. Tony is saying part two coming soon. So um, it's always nice to, to, like I said, we all have these plans for videos that are coming. And my favorite YouTube video uh, or favorite YouTube channel video is coming in winter. So if Tony does his second one in winter, I'm saying right now I'm not copying Tony's idea. It's just a coincidence that we're both doing it at the same time. So that's always fun. Okay. Uh, Nick is saying I'm grading the soap right now. So uh, let us know how it goes. And again, it's one of those things um, distribute it. You know, if, if you want to try the soap, hang it in one area for a couple days and then move it to a completely different area. That's another thing that I wanted to talk about when we are trying to deter the, the animal pests in our garden. Sometimes if you can just get them to change their normal pattern, that can be enough to save your garden. And so that was a big approach I took. And I mentioned that I did a video, it's been a couple years ago now, almost three years, about deer in the garden at, at my previous house. And that's one of the big strategies I had, particularly in my front yard where I had lots of flowers that they would eat, is the deterrence from that area using some of the methods I've already talked about. And if you can deter them long enough and entice them into another area, maybe with a food they like to eat or with an animal like a dog to get them to avoid the area in the first place, after a while their habit pattern has changed enough that they may no longer be the pest. You have those, those outliers, those, those young animals that haven't developed that same deterrence and they have to be trained all over again. But I've found that to work pretty well with things like the deer and the squirrels. If you can change their habit pattern so they're no longer visiting the area they were and instead they're spending more of their time someplace else, then you're less likely to have a problem with those particular pests. So bottom line is put all of this stuff together all of these different methods, the sacrificial plants, the camouflage plants, the barriers, the predators, the, the deterrence, the plant choice, all of this stuff really needs to be done at the same time, along with Irish spring soap and pepper sprays and water sprays and everything else. And even then, there's no guarantee that you're going to get rid of a pest. You're just really trying to get the pest to leave your plants alone and bother somebody else or live someplace else. So uh, those, those tend to be the best ways to deal with those animal pests. And, and then ultimately, like we were just talking about, trying to create that balance so you live with some of them. They're just happy in a different area of your yard than the area that you are are wanting to save for yourself and keep the animals away from as much as possible. So good luck with all of it because it is a challenge. It is something that you need to work on on a regular basis. And like the bird netting I'm talking about over my plants, I'll, I'll probably have that bird netting up uh, over those trees from here on out uh, because the deer will be looking for something to chew on in winter and they'll chew on the tender tips of fruit trees. And so while I didn't want to have to do it, now I have to do it. And so my young fruit trees will probably be covered with bird netting for the next two or three years until they get big enough that if the deer eat some of the outer branch tips, it's not going to damage the tree enough that it will pose a big problem. So look for that in the background of some of my future videos where you'll see the bird netting over my fruit trees. And it's not pretty, but I'll just have to live with it. I am trying to think, so if you remember a couple weeks ago, one of the backgrounds had the, the, um, the pink posts and I was talking about colored posts in the garden and adding a decorative component. Uh, let me know. So here's a question for you. 
I'm going to have these, these galvanized steel pipes around my fruit trees with the bird netting over them. And rather than have that bare gray steel color, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with those posts. And I'm, and I'm seriously planning to paint them. The question is, what do you think would look better? Should all of those posts be the same color? And if so, give me your opinion of what that color should be. Or should all of those posts be a different color? And so I've got an area where I've got eight fruit trees, and those are the ones I'm going to start with. What do you think would look better? To have eight posts, once I bury them in the ground, they'll end up being about seven or eight feet above the soil surface. So they're going to be sticking higher than these four and five foot tall trees I have. What would look better? A, a mini orchard with multicolored support posts for the bird netting to keep the deer away or posts that are all the same color, a uniform set of posts to hold up the bird netting. So I'm interested in your opinion because I, I, I don't know yet. I, I haven't figured out which approach I'm going to take. And so based on some of you and what you might think looks best, I may modify my, my end result uh, based on your input. So give me your input. Tell me what you think multicolor, or solid color and what colors those would be in an area that's specifically designed for the apple tree and the pear trees and um, those type of trees that at some point will be fruiting probably while these posts are still in place so i hadn't planned to ask that question but i'm glad i did um, and so uh, lila is saying uniform let the garden supply the color that's how i tend to think uh, but Gretchen says all different colors, so that's good. Um, Tony is saying I'd go uniform and cheaper than buying multiple cans of paint. And I did or paint. I did have that idea, Tony, but I discovered a box of probably thirty different cans of spray paint that I have, and so that's why I was thinking about going multiple colors, just because I do have all of these cans of spray paint, and I would probably need to buy more paint to go uniform, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of backwards, but I, I completely agree with you. Um, okay, let's see what else we have. Nicole Oliver, good point, multicolor, the grandkids will love it. I like that idea. In fact, since they're coming over, that may be a project that I can have the grandkids help me with. So I appreciate that, I, I do like that. Um, Kay says I would do multicolored as well. Carla says multicolored. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Melissa saying orchards use white for a reason. That's true. Emmy Miller saying multi shades of the same color. Ooh, I like that idea. Blues, teals, greens, and purples. Okay. So rather than complete opposite ends of the color spectrum or opposites, um, have more, uh, the same similar colors. I like that idea a lot. So, um, okay, and Jay is saying I use soothing same natural colors and different colors in different uses. Multicolors are exuberant but chaotic. Yeah, and, and I tend to like to have order in my garden. You know, you guys have probably heard me say something along those lines or have seen it. I like to have order, and so uh, I, I tend to avoid chaotic, so I agree with you on that, Jay. Um, but I like the idea of different colors, but the colors are in the same basic hue. So you got, you got me thinking. I love it. Uh, I appreciate all of it. Uh, Kevin's saying, I started my garden with all uniform green, but I found over the past year I like multicolor pastels. Okay, it livens up the space. And so, and so um, you, you've really got me thinking because... Um, I, I think I may have mentioned this when we were talking about that background a couple weeks ago, but I've got the T posts, the green T posts that are supporting the the archways. So the main archway with those wood raised beds, and then I have a new archway that I haven't shown in a video yet. And my plan was to use some of the brighter colors to uh, to paint those T posts. In the, in the beginning, I was thinking green T posts, subdued, the plants will 
will kind of camouflage the T-post. But now I'm thinking of painting those T-posts a vibrant color to add color to that space of the garden. And so maybe I'll do both. Maybe I'll do some vi vibrant colors in one area of the garden, and then I'll do some more of those subdued, um, similar hues in another area of the garden. So you see how things are always changing? When you have your plan developed, the plan is going to change. And then you've got to try to figure out what you're going to do at that point. So appreciate all of that input. I appreciate all of your help. I'll, I'll go back through and look at the um, comments like Gretchen's alternate the colors with white. I like that idea too. Uh, and then Melissa's got a good point too. Uh, put some of the colors to attract. And that's one reason why I'm planning to do some of those vibrant colors like red and purple in those beds that have those large hoops because the the flowers growing there are intended to be pollinator flowers. So I've got some vining cardinal flowers, for instance. And so the thought being that if I paint the post a particular color, that will at least get the attention of some of the pollinators and then they'll come in and they'll fly, find some of those smaller flowers that they might not otherwise have found. So good ideas, good ideas. You you all are so awesome. It's one of those things. Uh, interesting idea, Tammy, color code the garden. So I actually did that at the school garden. Um, I did have in the raised beds, we numbered all of the beds and I did color code the, the beds for planning purposes because we had, we would plant in about 90 beds a year and so we use the color coding and I use that primarily for the volunteers in the garden so that I could if I had a volunteer and we had a particular task I could direct them to an area of the garden that was coded either with numbers or with colors so um, good idea depending on the size of your garden it's one of those things that uh, you can start throwing in some of this stuff that we've just been talking about so, yeah, um, yeah, Melissa's saying 90. Yeah, we actually had 101 raised beds, but I typically wouldn't plant all of them. But we would we would plant four foot by eight foot beds. We would typically plant in between 75 and 90 beds. And so if you go back to some of my earlier videos, you'll see the Galileo Garden School Garden. And you can see a lot of those beds in the background and listen to some of my stories about the garden. So. Okay, so I got another question for you. And this question is, how do you gauge your garden's success? How do you determine if your gardening was successful in a given year? And I, I know too many of us are too critical of our own actions in the garden. And in many ways, what we're doing would be considered successful by another gardener. But because we're so harsh to ourselves, we tend to be our own worst critics, where our garden could be seen as successful by someone else. Instead, we focus on the failure, what went wrong, and think in terms of our garden not being successful. And so what do you use as that criteria? And so last year, for instance, I do not consider my garden to have been successful. We had uh, too much hail. We had late freeze in the spring, early freeze in the fall, and I wasn't able to grow a lot of what I wanted to grow. Now, overall, looking back, I built a whole bunch of new beds. I had pathways mulching. I accomplished a lot in the garden but i don't really think i would say i had a successful garden year last year and i've shared some of that in videos and live stream earlier this year already i can say i've got a successful gardening season this last week i harvested my very first sweet 100 cherry tomatoes unexpected totally was watering saw these two tomatoes plucked them right off, threw them in my mouth. That to me is one of my measures of gardening success. When I get those first tomatoes. Now, Sweet 100 is a hybrid. It's one of my favorite tomatoes to grow. It's almost 
always the first tomato. And officially, I just looked this up before I came on, officially it's a 65-day variety. So when the plants are in the ground, you should expect to have a harvest 65 days later if everything goes right. I got tomatoes at 45 days. And so that's why I say this is one of my measurements of gardening success. I started those sweet 100 plants from seed in my basement. I hardened them off. I put them in the ground later than I had hoped because we had such cool weather in late spring. And then the plants started taking off underneath my favorite tomato trellis. They're doing great and I've already harvested two tomatoes at the 45 day point, which is very unusual in my environment. So this is a successful year. This is one of those years that if nothing else goes right, I can say I had a successful gardening season. I ate two sweet 100 tomatoes weeks before they should have been ready to harvest. So what do you do? What will you use in your scale of good to bad, success or failure? What will you use? And if you haven't thought about those kind of things, start thinking about it now. Each time you go into your garden and you see something that makes you smile or you feel something that is a good feeling because of where you are in your garden, make note of that because those are the kind of things that I put into that success category. If I'm in the garden and I just have a feel good moment, I try to remember what generated that feel good feeling so that I can hopefully recreate it. But more importantly, identify it when it happens again. And when I see those things happen again, that's when I, I chalk it up as a success point. Last year, I had two. One was a brown and one was a green. A praying mantis show up in two different areas of my garden. That's one of those things that I look for. And when I see a praying mantis on my plants, I did everything right. I have a successful year attracting beneficial predators to my garden. I haven't seen one yet this year. I know they've got to be out there. That's a point that I look for. It's been a good year when the praying mantis is feeding on the insect pests on one of my beds. Same thing with lacewing. Lacewing, I talk a lot about ladybugs, but lacewing larva can be better than ladybug larva at eating aphids. And I saw lacewing a few weeks back, chalked it up as all right. I did things right to attract the lacewings to my garden. So start thinking about that type of list. Those things that you can be happy about what the things are in your list that tell you you had a successful gardening year and hopefully you've got the kind of list that there are so many things on that list that every year will be considered a success and that's why I, I, I'm asking the question have you thought about it what is what is it that you are looking for in your garden is it a good garden or a good garlic harvest that's on my list and so that's why I I harvest I grow so much garlic and I harvest all the garlic and then I find all these different things to do with the garlic like the video I did over the weekend where I made the garlic powder that's one of those measures for me of gardening success and so already this year I had a great garlic harvest I've already preserved some of the garlic and I've eaten two tomatoes Okay, close the door. I'm out of here. That's how I look at it. Everything from this point on, uh, it's gravy. It's extra. Everything that happens in the garden will make it even more successful because I've already established the baseline. I've met those minimum conditions. My garden is a success. I'm happy. Now we can just relax and let things happen and look for more successes but I don't need to focus so much on the failures and what goes wrong from this point forward because I have had those measures of success that'll, that keep me going. And I think that's an important aspect of this. It will keep you going when you can identify these measures of success and sit back and enjoy it and say, hey, it was a good year. 
was a good gardening year. It was a good gardening month. It was a good gardening week. And I hope this week ahead for you will be a good gardening week. And so be ready to share with us next Monday all those things that happened this week that you're happy with, that you consider a success, and that you want to tell us about when we get together, same time, same place, next Monday, to talk about gardening and share our time with other global gardeners. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your interest. Thanks for your knowledge. Thanks for your enthusiasm. And I'll see you next Monday. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.